I think it's then useful to think about the advantages and disadvantages of those. Fiat money creation is always possible. And you could say, and the great news is, that the public authorities can choose the optimal amount of fiat money creation. And I think it's important to realize that there have been successful periods of economic history which have involved the creation of fiat money spending power by the authorities without that getting out of control and without that leading uh, to hyperinflation. Uh, if you look at the period of US uh, history, uh, which is the Civil War and the immediate uh, post-Civil War period, where the US Treasury created greenbacks with which it paid, paid the Union uh, Army, uh, this was a perfectly successful use of fiat money creation, which did not lead uh, to uh, an excessive rate of inflation. But we've always been worried, or there's tendency to be worried, about fiat money creation because of the disadvantages on the right-hand side uh, of this slide. First of all, the fact that if you are creating new fiat money simply by running unfunded fiscal deficits, um, the allocation of those is a political decision, and then that can drive either wasteful investment or the rewarding of specific political constituencies. And second, of course, there's a very strong fear that the moment you accept that we can create new nominal demand with fiat money creation, that we will do it to excess. And then, of course, we talk about the hyperinflation periods of Weimar Germany or, more recently, Zimbabwe. So compared with that, creating additional credit by creation of additional spending power uh, through a uh, private credit creation might appear to have two advantages. First of all, uh, the allocation is determined by market uh, disciplines, supposedly. And secondly, the optimal amount might we suppose be ensured by an interest rate policy in line with Vixel's approach, where the money rate of interest is held close to the uh, natural rate of interest. I think we can see the fundamental problems which are created by the credit cycle as relating to the question marks on the right-hand side of this path. Do those advantages truly exist? Or can we have a, a, a situations where the allocation of privately created credit is as undisciplined uh, and as problematic as maybe fiat money creation, where the interest rate control process of the money rate of interest equal to the natural rate of interest is not an effective control. And a third issue, problems arising from the fact that if you create aggregate nominal demand by creating additional private credit, you leave an ongoing debt contract. And ongoing debt contracts in themselves have consequences. With that as background, let me now talk about three categories of problems in credit creation, which I think are problems beyond that on which Vixel focused, beyond the problem that there might be too much credit and therefore a price stability uh, issue. And these problems arise from the fact that banks create credit, money, and purchasing power, and therefore it matters to whom credit is extended, and we have to investigate to whom credit is extended. And as I said uh, on the previous slide, credit creates ongoing debt contracts, and those uh, have consequences. And it's because of these uh, that we have consequences going beyond price stability. Consequences that we can just usefully, somewhat arbitrarily, but I think usefully categorize under three headings, Hayek, Minsky, uh, and Fisher-Simons. First then, Hayek investment and overinvestment cycles. As I said, Vixel tended, like a lot of modern economic textbooks, to assume that every time you extend credit, you extend it to a business uh, to uh, invest in real economic projects. So too largely did Schumpeter, uh, and so too uh, did uh, Hayek. And let's assume for now that that is the case, that fundamentally we're talking about credit extension uh, in order to a fund new physical uh, capital investment. Once you understand that that is what credit could be for, there are two consequences, one of which could be positive for growth and the other of which could be harmful for the volatility of growth. The one which is positive for uh, the growth is the fact that if credit 
is extended primarily or entirely to businesses and entrepreneurs or to other categories of investor in real capital, such as a local government investing in an infrastructure project, then the extension of credit can skew demand towards investment and away from consumption. And it can therefore produce a higher rate of savings than would occur in an environment where all credit was extended on a direct basis and where you had to get an individual household to make a conscious decision to save. And from that comes the concept, which I don't think we talk enough about now, but I think is a, a valid concept, uh, which many of the early mid-20th century economists uh, wrote about, which was forced savings, the way that the credit allocation process can produce a higher level of savings than would otherwise occur. Uh, Hayek in the monetary theory of the trade cycle describes it, as you see on this slide, as an increase in capital creation at the cost of consumption through the granting of additional credit without voluntary action on the part of the individuals who forego consumption and without them deriving any immediate benefit. I think that concept of forced savings and investment skew within the credit allocation process, I think that is theoretically possible and I think there is empirical support for it in uh, economic history. I think if you look at uh, the uh, development, for instance, of Japan and Korea in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, I think there's a very reasonable case set out, for instance, in Joe Studwell's recent book, How Asia Works, that the use of the banking system, along with financial uh, repression, i.e. Uh, below free market interest rates on household deposits, and the conduit uh, of cheap credit through the banking system to industry, and particular heavy industry, uh, was part of achieving a higher rate of investment and therefore a higher rate of growth. However, the moment uh, you uh, mention uh, that, uh, one also realizes that can, can be a downside. Uh, as I said earlier, when I, uh, you hear this speech, I will be in China uh, looking at issues to do with the credit cycle there. I think there it's clear that the authorities have used a credit extension through the banking system to drive an investment-led economy. And that high level of investment has been crucial to a high rate of growth. But the moment you realize that it's been crucial to a high rate of growth, one also realizes that there can be potential disadvantages as well. You can end up creating over-investment cycles uh, in which you end up wastefully uh, investing at a low uh, rate of marginal productivity of capital, and you can create an economy uh, which is so much dependent on demand for investment created by credit extension that you have a fundamental imbalance between uh, the amount of capital being created and the consumption uh, demand uh, for the consumption goods that that capital will produce. And I think China now faces a major problem of how it can migrate out of that situation. So that if we look at uh, the Chinese figures on the next slide, slide nine, we are seeing in China through the banking system a huge expansion of bank credit, a very big increase of this variable with a, uh, it, that China uses total social finance to GDP, uh, which has been soaring over the last uh, 10 years. And this now is producing major concerns about an overinvestment cycle and an unbalance of the economy. In China, of course, some of the problems result come from a politicization of the credit allocation process. But before we assume that that's a special case, I think we should note that we have been through a recent Hayekian overinvestment cycle in countries like Spain and Ireland. This next slide uh, shows one of the many uh, almost entirely empty uh, provincial airports that have been built in Spain. And we have an illustration of the fact that even a free market uh, banking system uh, can end up uh, creating uh, too much uh, credit uh, in those cycles. So we can have over-investment cycles in a Hayekian sense, even if we are working on the assumption that the, uh, all of credit is extended to support uh, real investment 
in physical capital. But in fact, in modern economies, most credit, contrary to the textbooks, is not extended uh, for that reason. I think it's useful for us to think about the different categories of the way that credit is extended. It is sometimes extended as loans to businesses, entrepreneurs, to finance real investment projects. And we're on slide 11 now. We sometimes extended as loans to business speculators or investors, simply to finance the purchase of existing assets. It's extended as mortgage loans to households, which supports intergenerational asset transfer, which for sometimes finances new physical construction of houses, but sometimes simply the purchase of existing houses. And it is loans, unsecured credit, uh, to impatient houses, to temporarily cash-limited houses, or simply uh, to poorer uh, uh, households. Estimates that I've made of the balance of the UK in 2009 suggest that out of 1.9 billion uh, bank credit extended, Really only 232 million, so not much more than about 13 or 14 percent, is clearly provided to support the sort of productive investment projects that Hayek, Schumpeter and Vixel assumed was the whole of the credit creation process. Another slice is essentially supporting, well, is supporting commercial real estate, which involves some new physical investment in new real estate developments, uh, but also quite a lot of pure asset play in existing assets. In the UK, uh, the vast majority of credit, about 60%, 60 or 70%, supports residential mortgages, which in the UK has not actually supported a construction boom, but is primarily supporting the finance of already existing assets. And a significant slice supports pure life cycle consumption smoothing uh, and has really nothing to do with assets either new or existing. Once you realize that that is what credit does uh, in a modern economy, uh, I think we introduce a whole new possibility of the impact of credit, which is that credit can, in the fashion that Hyman Minsky described, create cycles of the price of existing assets and the amount of credit extended, which are self-reinforcing cycles. Increased credit extended drives increased asset prices, which then drives changes in the behavior, the apparent net worth, and response to the incentives facing both borrowers on the small inside cycle and lenders on the outside cycle. Uh, borrowers note that a, uh, the price of these assets have gone up and believe that it is then sensible to borrow more money and the demand for credit goes up. Uh, increased asset prices produce for a period of time low credit losses uh, that increases the net worth of banking intermediaries. It reinforces the belief of bank credit officers uh, that it is sensible to lend money against these existing assets, whether they be commercial real estate or residential houses, and therefore the supply of credit goes up, the supply of credit goes up and the demand for credit goes up, more credit is extended and asset prices go up further. These cycles of credit and asset prices of existing assets are, I think, fundamental to the dynamics of, an, of credit in a modern economy. And one of the implications of these, I think, is that the interest rate elasticity of demand for credit is probably highly variable uh, across different categories of credit, and that this is a fundamental problem for Vixel's thesis that we can simply constrain the credit cycle by focusing simply as modern central bank practice has tended to do, on making sure that the money rate of interest is appropriately set. Vixel, assuming that we are fundamentally talking about finance for new investment projects, says as long as we have the money rate of interest equal to the natural rate of interest, all will be well. But actually, as it shows here on the right of this slide here, slide 14, I think the interest rate elasticity of demand will vary significantly by use category and across the cycle in the light of expectations of asset price trends, which are themselves endogenously driven by the supply and demand for credit. That means that if you try to slow down a commercial real estate lending boom by increasing interest rates, 
you are likely, I think, to do significantly harm to real productive investment in the non-commercial real estate sectors of the economy uh, long before you slow down this uh, boom in the commercial real estate area where the estimates of a acceptable interest rate to pay are being driven by the expectation of asset price increases. You therefore have a danger that if you simply rely entirely on the interest rate to control credit cycles, you get the problem which Raghu Rajan referred to uh, in a uh, recent a lecture of the economy may get too many buildings and too few uh, machines.